the Honorable Emanuel Cleaver II represents Missouri's fifth congressional district. First elected in 2005, Congressman Cleaver is now serving his fifth term in the House of Representatives. Having served for 12 years on the City Council of Missouri's largest municipality, Kansas City, Congressman Cleaver was elected as the city's first African-American mayor in 1991. As a member of the House Financial Services Committee and the subcommittees on housing and insurance, as well as oversight and investigation, Congressman Cleaver works to ensure that his constituents in the 5th District have access to quality, affordable housing. Congressman Cleaver, as a native of Texas, is married to the former Diana Donaldson. They have made Kansas City home for themselves and their four children. Please welcome Congressman Emanuel Cleaver, second. Good morning. It's good to, uh, to, to, to be here with you um, uh, on, a, on a Thursday morning. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that happens on Thursdays, if you ever hear and you ask a speaker, they will be brief. Uh, because we go home today, uh, normally uh, most members of Congress at least will do a 48-minute speech, uh, but uh, on Thursdays it's usually a little bit uh, above eight. Uh, and I tell people, and, and this is a this is a fact. And for those of you, any of you who live around here, you know, uh, when that last vote is cast, if you're in the way. Uh, I mean, I'm, you know, that's just, it's just, it, it wasn't intentional. I mean, it, it, uh, so we are, I, I am pleased to be here. And uh, to be honest, you, 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 uh, you actually want me to be brief. Uh, I've, I've been around a long time. I've been involved in, um, in, in the government and in my real world, I'm, I am a, 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 a seminary trained, ordained United Methodist minister. Uh, so, uh, and in fact, I live in the Methodist building here uh, in Washington. And, and so over the years, I've learned how to read people. So I, I, I understand. Uh, people who come to, to church on Sunday morning, you know, they love the Lord, but they want to love him quickly. <laughs> and, and so, uh, And, and so, you know, I come here and, and, and people, you know, are, you know, acting like they're happy to have me speak. And, uh, and I, 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 uh, I had an invitation to, to go. I was born in a place called Waxahachie. And I was invited to come back and speak at the little church uh, where I was first baptized. I lived in Waxahachie, uh, my family and I, until uh, I was seven. Uh, I'll, I'll speak about that a little bit more later. But they'd invited me to come back uh, to preach at this little church, the Mount Lebanon Primitive Baptist Church, uh, where my grandmother had been a member uh, prior to Jesus being born. <laughs> uh, uh, and so uh, I, I go back to the, to the, to the church, and, and I mean, it's packed, and they have open the windows and, and there are people uh, standing around outside. And so um, I get ready to, to, to uh, speak and I stand up and I say to the congregation, I have nothing, no notes, nothing. And I just said, you know, it's good to be here. I mean, I, I didn't have any notes. I mean, after all, I had, been, I had been on Meet the Press, I had been on Oprah, I had been on Face the Nation. I mean, what, what I need with notes uh, going to Waxhatchee? I mean, I, I could quote Barth and Tillich and Kirk Kierkegaard, I could talk about eschatology and epistemology, and you know, why do I need notes in walks at you? So I, I stand up, you know, people are, amen, and, you know, glad to see you. So I said, uh, it's good to be here on your anniversary. You know, uh, what would you like for me to speak about? And the lady uh, in the back, an older lady who was my first Sunday school teacher, stood up in the back with her little handkerchief, and she said, uh, Cleaver, uh, I'd like for you to speak about Five minutes. <laughs> so you can't trick me. I, I know the deal. 
but housing is important to me, uh, and, and you'll, you'll know how important in just a, a few minutes, uh, because owning a home is a part of the American dream. Uh, it's a person's private piece of paradise. Uh, it, 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 it is their world. And when you own a home, it changes everything. Uh, my father is 92 years old, uh, uh, in, living in Texas. I went down last weekend. My dad, 92 years old, uh, you wouldn't know it if he walked in here, but uh, he's out in his yard working in November uh, because uh, he values this home so much that people on his street know that they can't even drop a cigarette butt out anywhere uh, within 100 feet of his home when he's out picking it up and wanting them to see it. And so there is pride of home ownership. And it, 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 it pushes people to want to take care of their paradise, their piece of, of paradise. Uh, but it also um, helps people to um, preserve neighborhoods. You look at a neighborhood where there are people living in their homes, you're looking at a neighborhood that's stable. Whenever there's home ownership, there is stability. Now my district, of Missouri's fifth con uh, congressional district, spans the urban core of Kansas City, Missouri to the farms of Marshall, Missouri, almost 100 miles away. And it is a microcosm of the country. In fact, if I had my way, every member of Congress would be elected from a district like mine. And the reason is that we then will begin to erase much of this hyper-partisanship that is destroying this country. I was interviewed uh, by the BBC last week, the British Broadcasting uh, Corporation. And the guys interviewed me, and, and then all of a sudden he throws this question out. He said, I just read a book by somebody, and I've, I've been trying to find out the, the, the author of the book, who is predicting that the, that the fall of the United States, like all empires, is inevitable. But that in the United States it will be caused by race and partisanship. Now, you know, it's just one person's opinion, but it is an opinion. It is an opinion. And in the fifth district, I have rural and urban. If you're representing a rural and urban district, it means you're going to have a, a, a panoramic view of America. It means you don't come in with an agenda just directed toward one little group. And I think we'd have a much better government if everyone had a district like mine. And over the last two years, uh, I've gotten to know my rural constituents. Most of them were surprised to find out that I grew up uh, in a rural area. Um, you know, that my grandpa both, on both sides had farms. Now, they didn't have a lot of money. In fact, my first cousin and I were, became the farm equipment. I mean, uh, <laughs> we, we face tremendous challenges today to provide every American the safe and affordable place to call home. More than five years into the worst foreclosure crisis since the Great Depression, we're finally, finally starting to see signs, albeit small, of a housing recovery. New home sales amounted to an annual rate of 467,000 in September. 2014, a 17% increase from the 399,000 homes sold in September 2013, but still well below the historical average of 698, 700,000 homes sold before the recession. 
the median new home price in September 2014 was $259,000, up from one year earlier. As existing uh, home sales increased by uh, close to 2.5% in September of 2014 from one year earlier. And the median price for existing homes was up by 5.6% during the same period. Home sales have been steadily rising, but they have uh, a lot further to go, given that home ownership in the United States stood at 64.4% in the third quarter of 2014, down from 68.2% before the 2007 recession. The current home ownership rates are similar to those recorded in 1996, well before the most recent housing bubble started. A strong housing market can boost economic growth, and there is still plenty of room for the housing market to provide more stimulation to the economy, more broadly than it did before the recent slowdown. We are still seeing uh, many individuals involved in long-term unemployment. And uh, the only way we are going to get completely out of the throes of the recession uh, is to do something to spur more growth in housing or greater growth in housing. Rural communities have different needs and different concerns than urban and suburban areas. And while all residents of the district that I represent need access to affordable housing options, my rural constituents depend on local nonprofits, federal agencies, Congress, state and local governments, and other industry leaders like you as they try to find a place to call their own. And of course, the USDA plays a critical role in rural housing by bringing the dream of home ownership within reach, improving the quality of life of rural citizens by helping them purchase a home. The central focus of USDA rural development work is serving the men and women who live, work, and raise their families in America's rural communities. They know how. They've been doing it for a long time, 150 years. And as we close out the least productive Congress in history, this is a fact. This is not an editorial uh, opinion. The 1948 Congress was considered the worst in history, the do-nothing Congress, as it was called, for those of you who are history students. This Congress will go down in history as having done less than the Do, Not, Do Nothing Congress of 1948. If I had time to take off on that, because the people who are, blame, who are to blame are not the people who I'm going to be with in a few minutes over on Capitol Hill. It's the people who sent them there. I can think of dozens, and probably hundreds, of issues that merit attention on the floor of the House of Representatives. A transportation bill, we need it. Create more jobs with the transportation bill than anything we can do. It is the number one stimulus. For every uh, billion dollars spent, it creates 40,000 jobs, most of them permanent. We need an immigration reform. We are a nation of immigrants. I have orchards in the rural area of my, of my a district where people are concerned that if they can't have labor coming in to pick the, the, their fruit, they'll die on the tree. It'll dry on the tree. We need a full and forthright budgetary process. We haven't approved a budget in the United States in almost five years, the most powerful nation on the planet. That, and it doesn't have a budget. A budget. A careful review of the implementation of the Dodd-Frank Act and of the Affordable Care Act. We need to, we need to look at those two pieces of legislation 
and pick out the things that are causing problems and make changes. There's nothing sacred about pr passing legislation here because everything we pass is flawed. And, it would, and if you were here, it would be the same way because we are all flawed. We're flawed people. And so flawed people can't do perfect things. So we need to make changes. I voted for them. We need, we need to make changes. I'll say it anywhere. They need to be reformed. And so there are a lot of things we need to do. We, 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 I mean, this stuff about, about I mean, on partisanship, I, I've never seen anything like this in my life. I mean, where people, if, it, depending on what alphabet you have after your name, they, they make a decision right there, you're either good, bad, or horrible. And the, I guess the worst thing is, you know, uh, the attitude over in Washington, which is this. I'm right, and you're evil. And the people who send people there, who cheer people on, they're the ones responsible for the do-nothingness. We need to set aside partisan political games, unnecessary delays, and, and begin to engage in full, open, transparent debate that we can deal with issues that you are concerned about. The American dream, to most Americans, is, is simple. Many tire and toil just to have an opportunity to raise a family in a place they can call their very own home. This dream is one that I am very, very, very close to and with which I am familiar. As I mentioned earlier, I was born in Waxhatchee, Texas. I lived in a, ha in a shack with no indoor plumbing no electricity till I was seven. And I keep a picture of this house hanging in my office in Washington and in Kansas City so that when I get up in the morning and walk into my office, I see it as a bold reminder of why I'm here and what I would like to prevent with other families. But my family story is uplifting. My father sent my mother to college when I was in the eighth grade. He worked three jobs. Four children, all of whom graduated. We left the shack and moved to public housing. Went to the big city, public housing. My father saved his money bought a lot, bought a house in a, in a white neighborhood where we couldn't live, and had the house moved at night to this black neighborhood. My father lives in that house right now, 92, by himself. I mean, his girlfriend comes over sometimes, but, <laughs> but um, And he is a, his yard is a candidate for the yard of the summer every year. Every year. So from a shack to public housing to having one of the prettiest yards in town. That's what home ownership does. I want to share with you another success story. Perhaps you know one, you know someone with a story like this. Or perhaps you have a story like this. One woman in Missouri, the late Elvira Metz, began working for USDA RD from the beginning in Benton, and then later Sykeston in 1935. The first office of USDA in which she worked was in the basement of a courthouse full of makeshift cardboard boxes used as furniture, an old-fashioned typewriter, and one bare light bulb hanging from the ceiling. 
At that time, there was no rural housing loans or any of the other 40 programs now delivered by the USDA. The beginning loans that were made at that time were to purchase and operate farms. There was no rural housing loans, no rural concern, frankly. And so this woman eventually was able to get a home loan and she constructed her home, but she wanted her outdoor toilet in the front yard of her farmhouse. And one borrower, she remembers, insisted that the outdoor toilet be grand. <laughs> she wanted to show it off to passerby us. And I know how she feels. Uh, I went through the, I never wanted it in the front yard, but uh, <laughs> you know, it, w it was important uh, to us. And that's a story that I can relate to because it's my, my own story. Elvira worked for 61 and a half years at USDA RD before she retired in 1996. 61 and a half years. In her decades of dedicated service, USDA RD adapted and changed to provide the best programs and deliver and best delivery to the customers they serve. One bill considered by Congress, the PATH Act, would change all of that. It would send us back to the basement of the courthouse with a manual typewriter, a bare light bulb, and what amounts to a toilet program. And as a member of the Financial Services Housing Subcommittee, it is my goal to work to ensure constituents in the 5th District that they would have success and access toward quality and affordable housing. We are now slowly but steadily making our way out of the worst recession since the Great Depression. There are continues to be bumps in the road, which is why it is important to remember that these are victories not only to applaud, but to build upon. At a time like this, we need more affordable housing and a stronger safety net. Look. The poorest people don't live in the city. They live in the rural communities. Every school in two of the cities that I represent in rural areas have more than 50% of their kids on the federal breakfast and lunch program. These are poor people. And we ought to be there ready to stand up and help them. And frankly, if we could get this superficial barrier torn down between urban and rural, we can fix a lot of things because what, as long as you can keep the rural people believing that their enemy lives in the city, they're going to be hindered as well from getting everything they need, both sides. And they're being used quite often. We need more affordable housing and a stronger safety net program, and we need a program to prevent homelessness. Federal assistance that was previously available to fill some of those gaps has been depleted and not replaced. I believe all of us agree that we've got to be creative in finding additional ways to provide homes to every American who needs one. One thing we all know is that despite our efforts over the past several years, and the improvements that we've made, there is still much work for Congress and our federal agencies. I hope you agree. Let me just tell you this as I, as I leave. Uh, you are needed, whether you believe it or not. The work that you do is important, maybe as important as anything anybody is doing. I know 
I've been there. I didn't read it in a sociology book. I know what it's like to, to struggle. I know what it's like not to have a home. I know what it's like to get up in the middle of the night and feel your way around because we didn't have electricity. Home ownership is important whether you live in New York City or whether you live on a new road in the rural part of the 5th District of Missouri. And we need to be together and demanding that Congress act, that Congress approves money to do the things that we need to do. You own this country, the greatest country in the history of the planet. You own it. This is your government. We rise or fall as a nation based on what you do and what you say to the people who represent you. Your mission, should you accept, <laughs> is to leave from this conference with new commitment, with new inspiration to deal with people in rural areas who need housing and their cousins in the city. Thank you very kindly.